Good evening, Andy, and welcome all to Part 11, I believe it is now, Andy, of our football book uh, podcast with Andy from myfootballbooks.com and me. How are you, pal? Are you OK? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, very good. Long time no speak. It's our yes. first time this year, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. it's incredible. It's already the end of February. I oh, know, it's crazy. <laughs> Where's that time gone? I don't know, but I've had one day off since New Year's Day. It's like oh, right. Been... Oh, it's been crazy. <laughs> and I know and did you that... enjoy that day off reading, did you? No, you know me. <laughs> I just don't have time. The amount of people that say to me, what are you reading now? And I'm, well, I ain't reading nothing. I've got hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of football books, but I just don't get time to read them. That's why I yeah. like to make the podcast with you, because we <laughs> can talk about them. And I find yeah. talking easier than reading. Um, before we do get into podcast, let's have a little bit about myfootballbooks.com and, and how your concept has grown from a project in lockdown to now yeah. absolutely massive, mate. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, almost, what, um, two years or so down the line. I forget exactly then, but um, yeah, but uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, the website is uh, myfootballbooks.com uh, and uh, which, I, until someone tells me otherwise, is, is the largest online football loan, football book only website in the world. Uh, and um, so I'm across uh, the various social media channels, so Twitter, where just recently we've got to over 10,000 followers, uh, just on Twitter alone, uh, but also on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and basically the website is, yeah, it's a series of recommended football books covering all areas of a beautiful game, from the past to the present, teams, players, managers, every aspect you can think of, really. Uh, and I also do a, a few newsletter that comes out the first of every month um, to really recap on the books that's come out that month and what's coming out soon, etc. So, uh, and if you don't mind, I also add a plug. Um, I also uh, merchandise football books, uh, bookmarks, and uh, my football mugs uh, as well. So to yeah, accompany you when you're reading your favourite book at the time. Absolutely. Um, the books that have come out before Christmas, we talked about on mm. the last podcast. What books did you have for Christmas, firstly? And what oh, books right. are coming out before Easter? Yeah, there's plenty coming out. So over Christmas, uh, well, a number of books, really. Um, one that sticks out, which is a book, because I've, I've read it before, but I wanted to read back to it. It was, um, uh, it was Natural by um, David David Tossel, which yeah. is the natural Jimmy Green story. Uh, it just reminded me to read it again, because of the... Harry Kane recently, you know, breaking the record. It was coming up to him, but really should break the record. And that's a, it's a fantastic story. A number of books have been written about Jimmy Greaves, but David Tossel's book's one that sticks out for me. Uh, and it just draws on interviews with family, friends, and colleagues and opponents. And it's, yeah, it's a great biography of, uh, well, one of England's most loved footballers. Does that's it mention, sticks out. does it mention the two goals that Tottenham didn't count because he scored them? In 1962, in the Charity Shield, and that's why Harry Kane is still behind Jimmy Greaves. Yeah, it does say that. Uh, yeah, it does say on the back of it, he'll record 357 top flight goals, Absolutely. which may never be surpassed. So, uh, yeah, exactly. 124 so, for Chelsea, uh, yeah. 220 for Tottenham, and 13 for West Ham United. Well done, James. Oh, by the way. He scored goals for AC Milan as well in Italy. Yeah, so. exactly, exactly. You forget <laughs> that, don't you? Yeah. Well, lots of people do, but but I don't because you know yeah. football it is a bugbear of, of both of both of us, and we do speak <laughs> about it on the podcast that football wasn't invented in 1992. I love the historic content of football and the books yeah. relating to that. Football, the first football season was 1888 stroke 1889. Preston yeah. North End won the league and the cup. They were the first team ever to win the double, the original yeah. Invincibles. And I believe in that football season actually did not lose a game. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. absolutely. But they wouldn't would they really, to be fair? If they won the Cup and the League, they wouldn't have lost a game. What a <laughs> season. Phenom- yeah. Phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely. Those sorts of books I've got on at the moment, and uh, if I, I'll probably kick off, actually. That's what I, I read over Christmas. Uh, I've not done, I managed to do as much reading so far this year, but uh, one book that's landed on my uh, post today, or on the doorstep, is um, a book that's literally come out today called The Match. I've got it uh, out. <laughs> you've got it? Excellent, yeah. yeah. So the story of yeah. Italy versus Brazil, 19... 82, and it's a, well, as you've seen it, then it's a chunk of a book, isn't it? It's, I was just enormous. about to say, describe <laughs> how thick this book is. I've got it on my bedside cabinet. If I dropped it, it would break <laughs> my foot. It's huge, yeah. isn't it? And it's only about a match. I know, I know, it's incredible. It's over, for, over 500 pages about one match. How do you which do says that? about the game itself. I know, it's, but, but it's beautifully written as well, and I think. You can tell already it's one of these, it's going to be an all-time classic because actually it's already been released um, across the world uh, in other parts of the world. I know when I shared it on on Twitter, uh, a number had already mentioned it because I have followers all over the world, which is incredible again, <laughs> the reach. Um, but you'll see just in the first few pages, it says um, uh, what you've got, the Gazzetta della Sport, it says it's an ode to football, a poignant ode to the most beautiful game in the world. Uh, some of wonderful stories which keep you glued to the page, but it is one chunk of a book. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is. Not, you're not going to read it in one session. Well, you will be well, amazing. It's it probably about six years to read that the way that <laughs> I read football books. <clears throat> but it is quite phenomenal when you think that yeah. it is just a match. I love the uh, the cover there. You've got Paolo Rossi in uh, Junior. Yeah. Uh, just shadowing him, the story of Italy versus Brazil in 1982. And wouldn't it be great? I mean, I do a podcast, uh, uh, another podcast called Game of My Life. This would be one of the games of yeah. uh, certainly of my lifetime of watching football. But what I yeah. do is I talk to a player and they talk me through that game that they played in. Sadly, we wouldn't be able to talk to Paolo because he, he has um, mm. passed away. I think he passed away last year, didn't he, Paolo Rossi? Yeah, and Junior yeah, could probably recently. only speak Portuguese. So um, yeah. we, we probably won't be doing a podcast um, about this match. But there is a book about this match. And wouldn't it be great if you looked at all the most historic, iconic games in the history of football and somebody wrote a chunk-sized book about yeah. all of them, I'd love, I'd love to have them in my library. Wow. It would be impressive, wouldn't it? It wouldn't would be it impressive. Just? What's quite fitting, actually, I did notice today that I, I was, I was to John um, Motson, obviously, who sadly lost just uh, very recently. I know he put it as one of his his favourite ever games that he ever commentated on as well. So it's quite fitting, really. And I, I know I was watching back some highlights, um, and is it, there's a bit where um, if you remember Serginio. I yeah, think they were 1-0 yeah, down at the time, and he, mm. he missed it, didn't he? Yeah, and, he did, yeah. Uh, John Motson says it's the sort of miss a Sunday morning player wouldn't have missed. <laughs> so, got a good line in there, Motson did. But Sir so, Junior uh, was, I mean, I don't know much about him. I do remember him from that game and that 82 uh, tournament of Brazil, but yeah. he, he was probably, I'd, it does sound a little bit disrespectful, and you shouldn't really say, but I'm going to. But he's yeah. probably the worst Brazilian central striker of all time, isn't he? Yeah, he was, wasn't you know, he? But that's he, he, all they he, needed. Imagine Ronaldo, you know, the yeah. Brazilian, the proper Ronaldo, playing in that yeah. 82 team. I know. Do you imagine any, like Pele, playing in that 82 team? Could you imagine any of the great Brazilian forwards playing in that 82 team? They'd have won the World Cup. He's, I think he, he's probably unfairly carried the candle for the team's defensive failings. But I think the fact that he played alongside the likes of Socrates, Zico, mm-hmm. etc. You could, you know, any player would look uh, average against that lot, wouldn't they? But uh, I think, uh, yeah, he was a huge centre forward, wasn't he? He was a big old right lump. lump of a player. Yeah, right lump. But, uh, Almost as big as his book. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a fantastic. I love the way the book is actually, if you've had a chance to have a glance through it, the way it's written, there's lots of short stories. Actually, the contents go over five pages on its own. But it's a series of short stories. It makes it, um, will make it easy to read as well. But one 
one thing I will put, Guy, I jumped to one of the pages that says on um, conclusion, and it quotes um, it's Tim Lewis, uh, who says this. It says, I'm not exaggerating when I say that Brazil's defeat against Italy was the worst and the most destructive event in my first seven years on this earth. The separation of my parents was barely a setback in comparison. <laughs> so it just shows the attachment people had to that game as well. I, uh, I, and the would, fact that, hmm. I would agree that that game really was um, a scientific football team, Italy, yep. and the yep. way that they played. I, I believe in that tournament, and I, I haven't got the records in front of me, but if I looked at Brian Glanville wrote a brilliant book about the World yeah. Cup and it goes back from the, the first tournament in 30 up to, yeah. I think it was the Russia tournament that um, that he wrote yeah. it either just before, yeah, I think it was just before Russia uh, World was. Cup, if I'm honest. Yeah. And I think if we went through to that one in 82, I don't think Italy won a game in qualification and probably only scored one goal. From memory, yeah. they seem to have drawn a lot of go- a lot of games, but this was the game that Paolo Rossi really yeah. came to the fore, and Italy knocked out the prospective uh, champions. And I think that Brazil was everybody's team because of the way that they played. Mm. Fans fell in love with them, but Italy were very, very, very functional, and and of course yeah. went on to win. The, the the World Cup and there are some schools of thoughts that say that's arguably the worst thing that happened to football in eighty two that the yeah. science took over from the art. Yeah, you've got a great memory as well because Italy did they drew all their group matches. Did they really? Uh, against Poland, Peru and Cameroon. Mm. I mean you think of the teams they were playing against and uh, yeah, they managed to get through to the next round when in comparison you uh, the Brazil team and that's what caught the imagination. They yeah. were yeah, they were scoring goals for fun. How many stages. goals did, did Italy score in that qualification? Because I can't remember many. What, uh, what was the result? Well, Have you got it to hand? It was, it was, it was nil-nil, uh, one-one and one-one in the group stages. Yeah, got you. So it was two um, So in the second round, they played Argentina, I think it was. Because it was kind of split, wasn't it? You had that kind of weird split of yeah, the smaller groups, groups didn't you? Because yeah, England, we, we played in that tournament. We didn't get mm. beat. We were the only yes. team, I believe, that didn't yes. get beat, and we come out. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, a mad it's way. Good, of, it? it was a mad way of doing the World Cup back in those days, because they had groups and pools, and then you played, yeah. and 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 I, I do think the formula now, you actually win a game in a knockout, and then you go through. If you get beat, you go out. And yeah. I think it's a far better way of doing it, because yeah. they they Definitely. kind of didn't do it like that in those days. I think they had a group, and then another group, and different pools, and it was, it was just a bit bizarre, bizarre and bonkers. But I think it was probably... Um, as commercialisation had kicked yeah. into football, they were yes. looking to maximise income revenues, etc., and um, giving you more bites of the cherry. Yeah, definitely. And it talks about in this book, I see in the, uh, it gives you a bit of a preview, it talks about how the commercial side uh, of the World Cup influenced every, the Mondial uh, influenced every aspect of the game as well. So, um, but uh, just on that, sorry, England, yeah, they drew against West Germany, obviously went got them yeah. to the final. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> just again, it shows you how that, how it, it was a strange way how it was uh, set out in those times, wasn't it? Absolutely. The knockout stage. And I love the way the match is, is mm. written on the front cover. Piero yeah. Trellini, I don't know much yeah. or anything about Piero, but he must be very, very proud of yeah. this book. And, and it is done in a kind of a, a, a transitional period of the 70s through the 80s, the way that the match is drawn. And, and what I also must stress is pitch publishing do so mm. many fantastic books, but they yeah. do the best front covers as well, don't they, Peter? They do, I don't, don't know. They? They I don't do. know who works for them doing that, but he or she is an <laughs> absolute genius. You don't have to overdo it, do you? Uh, no. Sometimes so. certain books, or so you just 
that is just an iconic picture just on the front, isn't it? And like you say, the way the, the match is written, yeah, and it just sticks out. You don't need to do anything more than that, and it just works perfectly, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's, uh, it's eye-catching, isn't it? So, you look uh, at it, you, it just says, buy me down it. It does, yeah, it does. And then you realise how big it is, the yeah. chunk of it. I must admit, I did obviously no idea until it arrived, and I thought, crikey, that is more than a hell of a book. That's going to take me some time, that is. It's not going to be a couple of sit downs. <laughs> so, uh, it certainly yeah. won't. And, <laughs> but um, it looks an easy enough to read, like I say, because it's broken into. I just like the way it's written, and it's little chapters. So uh, it's got lots of little stories. So you've got little stories, it says, um, one that talks. Because it breaks it down. You've got the match, and then you've got the first half, and then you've got various subtitles, um, uh, sub chapters underneath that, and then half time, second half conclusion. It's Yeah, it's broken down into lots of easy to read areas so uh, yeah look forward to reading it and uh, yeah what an iconic match that look, was I look forward to just looking at the front and the back cover and skipping <laughs> through and looking at the colour pages in between. there is colour pages in it yeah you see <laughs> it's lots of colour pages as well to look at as well the, the text frightens me it's absolutely <laughs> as you say a chunk <laughs> of a book um, a book that I also want to give um, a mention to in uh, in the podcast this month is uh, the road to seventy six by Francis Peacock, and it's okay. a story of um, of Queens Park Rangers season in seventy five to seventy six, where they finished the football season top of the pile, and Liverpool had just got to go to an already relegated Wolverhampton Wanderers, and uh, they did put Wolves to the sword and overtook Queen's Park Rangers and as as a um, a result they took the first division championship away from Shepherd's yeah. Bush back up to Merseyside but that QPR team I mean of mm. course we can remember Liverpool players and Liverpool teams because St Shankly walked yeah. through those gates at Anfield he really transformed Liverpool and turned them into one of the greatest sides in the world. Yeah. But when yeah. you're looking at that QPR team, we could probably name more Queen's Park Rangers players of that season than Liverpool. Yeah. I think QPR were absolutely fabulous. And and in this book, the uh, the road to 76, Francis Peacock absolutely nails Queen's Park Rangers' greatest ever season. And I think... If you turn the seven and the six around, you get 67, which are, mm. I think is quite ironic there because 1967 was the year that Queen's Park Rangers won the League Cup and uh, Rodney was oh. the uh, the darling of the terraces. And in 1976, it was Stanley, the guy who replaced yeah. him, that was the king of Loftus Road. Stan Bowles, yeah. I I've seen that book because I think the... Um, is it. The, the profits of the book were donated to the Alzheimer's Society as well, isn't it? For Stan I'm Bowles. not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I saw it somewhere. So if I, if I think of the same book you're referring to, The Road to 76. But yeah, what a, again, like you said, what a team that was. Absolutely. That and and I would love to have all these different books of these iconic mm. teams of the seasons. There's the season uh, 1971 72 season by Dan Abrams, who I've cut a podcast yeah. with with Daniel, um, and that's about that iconic season. And, and I guess, <clears throat> really, it was my first season growing up as a kid, appreciating mm. football. And it's great to have the memories of month yeah. by month, all that went on, not just over here in in the UK, in England, in Great Britain, but a yeah. more general in Europe as well. And you look at it, you you just think you've got it there in your hands. Yeah. It's a ch- again another chunk of a book, great yeah. iconic covers, and memories of a fantastic season of uh, yeah. of the seventies. Absolutely, absolutely. Was it Dave Sexton? Was the the Chelsea? Was he the manager of the QPR at that time? Um, in nineteen seventy one, seventy two, Dave was still at hey. Chelsea, unfortunately. I- 75, 76, sorry. He, the... he may well have been, yeah. Yeah, I'm almost, I can't remember. I'm almost certain because there was Sexton, there was Jago, 
the, the, yeah. they had um they 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 had a few managers didn't they around that time uh, it did, yeah managers. i'm trying to remember but yeah. i'm sure uh without researching it i'm sure <laughs> that um that sexton was the manager because remember yeah. alan saying to me uh, he, he was talking to frank mcclintock and McClintock was saying you let you let basically he was saying you let Dave down you players and and yeah. um or he had his opinion of Dave Sexton and and Dave Sexton done really well at QPR yeah. Dave yeah. Sexton done really well at Chelsea as well but you know I never met the guy I've only seen or seen the um the results of his fruits of his labours. Yeah. And through Alan, you know, I'm I'm absolutely convinced that Dave Sexton was a great coach, and Alan would say he was a great coach and he was a lovely man, but he wasn't yeah. a manager. And no. again, I'm not too sure when he arrived, how long he had it, but sometimes managers take over at football clubs in yeah. in, a, in an ascendancy rather than sometimes they take over a club when they're at the bottom and they've got to build yeah. it. So I'm not 100% certain, but a great coach, yep. but not a great manager, is what Alan no. Hudson would say about well, su- Sexton. He succeeded Tommy Doherty at Man United, I remember Sexton as well. Yes, he I did, know, yes. In the middle of the 70s, around about that time. So, and again, I know all of this just from reading the books, I must admit. Yeah. Uh, not quite at that age, but um, there's, a, there's a number of books that I can just... Read off the top of my head, actually. Get it on. About the Howard 70s rock football by John Sperling. You've got All Crazy cut, Now. We've cut 90s. both yep. with those, All Crazy Now, and mm. Get It On with uh, both David and John. We've cut podcasts, so they're out there on Great. all the usual uh, outlets for podcasts, uh, Spotify and Apple, etc., yeah. etc. Et and again, great chunks of books, mate. Yeah, absolutely. And great list to run on your podcast as well. So it brings it to life as well off the page. So, uh, but some great stories, isn't it? Great characters. I think uh, the greatest characters. Songs. I think yeah. the greatest. And going back to Dave Sexton, I remember mm. Ron telling me that when he, he took over as Aston Villa manager, he had Dave working with the kids. And, and that was yeah. something that he developed from Jimmy Ogan because Jimmy was a great coach. Yeah. And, Jimmy was the um, he was the, the the coach of the third team, and Ron said yeah. he was that great a coach. I remember I didn't want to play for the reserves; I'd rather play <laughs> for Jimmy. And he remembered <laughs> that, and he knew that Dave was great with the kids and a great coach. And he brought Dave Sexton in at Villa to to yeah. coach there. So you know, often is the case with great men of football, not mm. necessarily managers. Although yeah. some have managed, but the longevity of their career is overlooked because, in many instances, they were coaches of intermediate or third teams or the reserve yeah. team. But they're still about and still very, very influential in what they do with, with the development of the uh, of the younger yeah. players. And Dave Sexton also, if memory serves me right, was under twenty one manager or coach, wasn't England. he? England. Yeah, he was, yeah, England, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember reading that as well. God, I think it was, was in well. the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I might have in the 90s, yeah. I think so, and, and I think if memory serves me right, well, two wasn't, wasn't, he, um, wasn't he at Coventry City as well as a, as a coach? You know, yes. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, a, a, again, a, a great, great coach. Career. Yeah, great, <laughs> great coach, great career. And sometimes you're better off working at what you're best at, and I think in Sexton's case, uh, coaching yeah. rather than management. What else you got, mate? Uh, well, I'll refer to another book that's come out today. Um, uh, recently is what? Well, sorry, come out today. It's called the Derby Game. Uh, this is again out through pitch. It's by um, Ian Collis, and it's basically a history of local rivalries. And again, it's only it's come out today. I've only just received it as well. Um, but it's it's basically the history of the game. Um, and it's focused originally around um, the Derby Shrove tied football. Back I don't know if you're team. familiar with that. It's, <laughs> oh yeah, God, um, oh yeah. I've seen, well, I've you've seen got the YouTube Ab- clips. Well, that's the Zabaston, but this one's actually in, um, 
I know which one you refer to. This is the one in Ashbourne, though. The Shrove Tide football game yeah. is the one in Ashbourne, which is played on Shrove Tuesday. That's the it was one. only last week, actually. Yeah, and uh, um, actually, I always famously remember there's a there's a picture of Brian Clough because uh, they always have a celebrity of someone of um, significance that kicks the uh, starts the game off, and Brian Clough uh, kicked it off. I think in one of the years, might be 1975 oh, something like that. There's a picture of him being held up by a load of um, the players and he's holding the ball and then he chucks it and they all start. And it's, it's basically between two sides. One that's up at the top of the hill and then yep. there's another team at the bottom of the hill and they've got to get it into each other's uh, area, etc. But um, it's but it's this book, yeah, I think the, the Averston ones, I think that's, I can't think what it's called, but I know the one you talk about where they literally are scrapping with each other, aren't they? Yeah. It's similar to this, this one. <laughs> that one is, yeah, I've seen the videos. It's unbelievable, isn't it? It's brutal, isn't it? <laughs> <But>, yeah, very. <laughs> and this, the Derby show card's quite similar, but it talks about that, um, it talks about <coughs> the history of that game, uh, and it's been going for, well, years and years and years, a long time ago, but it, it talks about, it's a fascinating tale of, uh, um, exports of rise of local football. So this is on a very much a town level. I mean, it covers the early clashes of local rivals in Victorian football, you know, hot spots. And then it's just, again, another, I know we talked about a lot, it's a lot about when people forget how football started in the other Victorian times. And, you know, we think of massive rivalries now, don't we? We just had Rangers Celtic yesterday in the league, uh, the league Cup final, and that's just one of them. But, um, but yeah, it's an interesting book, so the history of local rivalries, and uh, um, yeah, which just gives it another angle to football in itself, isn't it? But that's how they uh, get the the the, mm. the the word the derby, isn't it? Because of yeah, those games that that go back in in you know historical times where yeah. you would have four hundred aside, there would be a scrap <laughs> and a ball yeah. somewhere in the middle of the scrap. And yeah. and uh, you know, derbies are the most fiercest games that you that you'll play often in a derby. Yeah. There isn't much football being played, but it's very physical <laughs> and, and that that's why they do give them the name the Derby, because that's where yeah. they come from. So yeah. so yeah, book out now and 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 again, great timing because it does go back to the time of the, the Shrove Tuesday and those uh, those historical games played years ago. But um, I'd have given that a right wide berth. I wouldn't have got involved in any of them games. Far oh, God, too no, phys- yeah. far too physical for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely frightening. They're just thugs. <laughs> and it it goes on for hours and hours, isn't oh, it? God, oh God, yeah. The Shrove. The Shrove Tide uh, game in uh, Ashbourne, I think it starts on the Tuesday, and I don't think it ends for the following day. And um, I actually thought, I remember seeing a clip of it a few years back where they had the local reporters there, and the, the town looks like an absolute, like an Armageddon. Oh, you would you know, do, there's, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's stuff everywhere, walls knocked over. But yeah. what they always do, the year, like the day after, they clean up all mm-hmm. themselves. They Because walls falling down, they build it back up, etc. And like, it's spotless again, because they, they, like, they enjoy it, don't they? It's a re- it's uh, tradition, isn't it? Yeah, but, uh, it's great madness, though, now, yeah. knocking all out of each other and knocking, smashing yeah. the town on the going there day after, after the alcohol has uh, dissipated yeah. <laughs> and going and building it back up again. But yeah. why do they call it Shrove Tide? Where does the tide come into it? Oh, I think it's... Ooh. So I kept hearing that on Talk Sport, where they're saying Shrove Tide, and I thought... Where's the tide? Because there's no sea where they're yeah. playing in Atherston. But they did keep mentioning tide, and I thought, I'd not heard that before. I've always I'm not heard sure. I'm Shrove Tuesday, that. but not Shrove Tide. So, I'm not sure it's been... I don't know if it's linked to the name of the ball. I can't remember, because the know. ball's slightly bigger than a normal football. Oh, and, God, um, oh, yeah, it's like a pudding, uh, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it's like a, like a hand... <laughs> um, leather ball, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's like um, a big medicine like ball yeah, in it. it That's it. It's, I think it's actually filled with cork chippings or something like that, Isn't which it really? actually floats on water or something. Like I remember oh, okay. it weighs. I've got it here actually. It says weighs uh, four pounds. Okay. So uh, yeah, the the ball is carefully hand painted as well. The design chosen by the local person who picked to turn up the ball at the start of the match. So that's like Brian Clough. Um, and the weather, but um, 
Not sure whether it's a show trial or not. It must be linked to the show trial anthem is a song that was written in 1891. So, oh, yeah, right. okay, I can't have. Maybe someone who's listening can help us and um, explain. <laughs> or if not, we like, can always at a later date go on to Google and have a look. <laughs> yeah, or read, it. or read the Never book. Doubt. <laughs> or read the book. I'm sure it's in the book, and it, it explains is, yeah. all about the Shrove Tide games. Yeah. Uh, what else have you got for us, mate? Uh, so I'm just going to focus on ones that have yeah. been recently released then. Yeah. So I've uh, run through some others that were released uh, in February. Um, I'll just run through a couple of these scripts because I've not read them on myself. But you've got, there's a book called The Social One, and it's by Marius Mans- Mansos. And it's just, it's, it sets out why Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool Football Club are a match made in heaven. So it's just talk about the social aspects. And uh, yeah, there's a strong hold of socialism, Klopp and the man who says he never would, vote for the right and spoke to the heart of the city and became a, an honorary scouser uh, and it just talks about it's a, it's, uh, it's a detailed portrait of Klopp and it's not just a football ball but a, mm. a study of leadership and motivation so it's a, again it, you can, you, there's many different aspects you could talk about football isn't there and there's always yeah. been a link to uh, society and politics and what, whether you like it or not there's was always been a, there's a close link and uh, Clearly, there is on the um, yeah in Liverpool as well, um, but that book uh, has recently come out. Again, that's come out through Pitch. Um, and the one that's come out through Pitch is called A Nation Again, which is the inside story of Scotland's journey to the European Championships. Um, and it's basically a chaotic tale of Scotland's men's teams return to a major tournament after more than 20 years in the wilderness. And this is about when they. Qualified for the Euro 2020, which actually played in 21, wasn't it, because of yeah. COVID? Uh, and um, yeah, it just talks about the Scottish FA turned to Steve Clark at the time, you know, after a number of managers had tried before, Strachan springs to mind, Alex McLeish, I think, was another one. There was a few attempts, wasn't there? So uh, to try and get them back into a major tournament. Yeah. Um, but that will certainly appeal to uh, people north of the border. And one other one I'll just mention as well, well, a couple of us, uh, Eternal. Yes, um, Wayne Duncan Barton. Edwards. Yeah, yeah, by Wayne Barton. So uh, uh, I've not read it yet myself, but again, it's a good another big chunk of the book. And uh, yeah, so it's a few footballers, you know, demanded as much his, uh, as much attention as Duncan Edwards. You know, he was obviously a shining jewel, wasn't he, of the the Bus- Busby Bays. And he was only 21 when he tragically passed away you know, as a result of the injuries he picked up. Obviously, the Nunicare disaster, which is. Um, Obviously commemorated not that long ago, was it, in February? Yeah, awful. Like in, it's yeah. not the first book about Duncan. For, no, it's not. Uh, I believe no. it's probably a different kind of book because there's no point in bringing out the same book. So I don't know what angle Wayne has, has looked at and has, um, has written about, but he's, yeah. he's a, an author of many Manchester United books and... I did do a podcast with Wayne when he brought brought out was it was it True Genius about True George Genius Best? yeah George yeah. Best last couple of years back now yeah, wasn't it was, it? yeah. yeah yeah a couple of years ago yeah yeah he's got a wonderful style of writing he's very much like the inside person when it comes to anything Manchester United related and uh, mm. but that particular book yeah I've not read it myself but it's um well it's it's, it's already like doing incredibly high like you're looking at all the rankings like on Amazon places like yeah. that so. Uh, so you can kind of tell, kind of, when some books are good. So, uh, um, but um, yeah, it's 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 a brand, it's brand new York book, but it takes a look at like all his life and his childhood, and obviously it's um, it's got authorization from the Edwards family, so that maybe gives it a bit more of an in-depth look, let's say, a bit more yeah. of a personal look, as opposed to just talking about how great a footballer he was. That's what Wayne's really good at. He talks about things just away from the pitch as well, yeah. a bit about the individual, and that brings it a bit more to. Uh, a personal touch, let's say, a bit more intimate, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, what a what a player he was, and uh, obviously, at just the age of twenty one. Yeah, is, sad. Um, yeah. I mean, the average age of the babes was uh, was twenty two, um, and yeah. when eight of them sadly uh, died in the uh, the the air disaster at Munich when they yeah. stopped off to refuel after the. A three three draw against Red Star of Belgrade and Duncan died a few days after um with uh, the injuries that he sustained 
in that yep. uh, air disaster. It was it was horrendous. The flowers of Manchester, the flowers of English football, and uh, never mm. shall be forgotten. So well done, Wayne, for uh, yep. writing well a fantastic book, Eternal, about uh, the great Duncan Edwards, one of yep. our greats that most of us have never seen. But mm. you know, when you get a player that is so great, you 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 arguably don't really need to have seen him play because yeah. when players tell you that he was that good, you yeah. just take it as red. It's not yeah. that we didn't see, you know, many games of Puskas or Di Stefano or you know Neil Franklin, for instance. But mm. we we know that they were great players because of yeah. what's been written about them and what's been passed down. And, uh, yeah. Yep. Fantastic Gone but not forgotten. Can, yeah, fantastic yep. that we can we can uh, use text and um, and keep those memories alive. So eternal yep. boy Wayne Barton. What else we got, mate? Well, linking on to sort of Gone but Never Forgotten, uh, a book a book another come out um, uh, in February is uh, Forgotten Football Clubs uh, by Philip O'Rourke, and this is about fifty teams across the world that are no longer in existence in one way or another. Um, and they're gone, but uh, yeah, not forgotten. So it's a, it's a fascinating story. I've, I get, I've read a part of it, but it's based the stories of 50 lost clubs from around the world, including their histories, successes, and ultimate failures. But the, what's interesting, it takes it from all around the world as well. It's literally clubs from England, France, Japan, China, Australia, all all areas. So, but to just give you a bit of a, a snippet, it, it talks about. Um, um, there's an Irish club that, um, called Sporting Fingal FC. They're a team who have formed and the won a cup, reached Europe and folded literally in the space of three years. Oh, so they were formed, won a cup, reached well. Europe and folded. So it's quite a, quite a quick story, yeah. uh, but what a success in such a short time. But a club that you never would have heard of, you know, if it weren't for books like this. Um, but it also has books about there's a club that played at the highest altitude in the world. Uh, and um, the woman's well, you 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 know of the um, the Dick. Oh, I think the lady names. That's Dick it. Yeah, Dick that was the uh, munition uh, munition yeah. uh, factory in, uh, in Lancashire. Yeah, it defied the odds and became the pioneers of the women's game. They were trailblazers for the well, girls worldwide to dream of becoming footballers themselves. Lily Carr um, so played from didn't she? That's it, yeah, mm. that's it, Dick Curley. So, uh, yeah, there's a number of other books, but that's um, Forgotten Football Clubs. Um, and again, by Pitch Publishing. So, uh, again, some lovely artwork on that one as well. So, uh, but again, it just it's, it just evokes memories and nostalgia and all those past glories and stories, again, you never would have heard of if someone like uh, Philip O'Rourke didn't do things like that and put pen to paper. So, uh, yeah, looks a fascinating read. Um, the year we nearly mm. won the league, Jonathan Baker, about Stoke City in the 1974-75 ah, yeah. season. I think yeah. Stoke were uh, four, four points off being crowned champions of, of England. Um, that would, I mean, 1974-75 season. So that started in the August of 74 through yeah. to the May of 75. Alan Hudson joined Stoke City mm. in the January of 1974. And our next podcast, Hudson 74, we're going to be talking all about that year. We Great. did a podcast um, about 1973 yesterday once more, which was a big hit for the Carpenters in 1973. And, yeah. and the favourite of Alan Hudson. So we looked at Alan's last year at Chelsea in 1973, and we're going to be looking at Alan's first year at Stoke City from January the 1st to December the 31st. And it's going to be a remarkable podcast. It'll be a little bit yeah. like a, a chunk of a podcast, a bit like the the match by Piero Trellino. Yeah. Because we don't yeah. just look at the games, we look at the music. Um, our regular podcast is My Life, My Music. So we're going to be looking at the music around that times and, and certain things that happened 
around those times the IRA were bombing not just yeah. pubs but bombing a lot in and yeah. on the mainland we uh, we had Watergate as well in America I noticed yeah. uh, and and put up on Alan's socials today Ted Bundy was uh, was on the run in America God. and it was the year that Seattle Saunders or Sounders were born yeah. in 1974 a club that Alan joined a few years after he joined and played for Stoke City after his Arsenal encounters and and years there at Highbury. So, so yeah, looking forward to making that with Alan, 1974, yeah. Hudson, 74. Excellent. Was that his first season at Stoke City? The yeah, start of that he, season, 74, 75? No, it, it would have been the 73, 74 season was his right. first, but he didn't join... Okay. He didn't join till the January of seventy four, so they yeah. had half a season uh, okay. already. Yeah. Um, Stoke City, when Alan joined, they would played away at Ipswich. They drew one one, and as a consequence, dropped into the bottom three. And Alan right. turned to his uncle George and says, "George, what have I done?" But yeah. by the end of the season, Hudson had transformed. Stoke yeah. City's uh, triumphs onto the pitch, and they got into Europe. So they were they were playing the likes of Ajax the season after. But uh, we're going to be talking all about that iconic first twelve months of of Allen. And I think that there is a school of thought that if Udi would have joined earlier, perhaps Stoke mm. would have won the league. But but there you go. It's all ifs, buts, and maybe. Well, it- it was his autobiography that uh, the manager at Sarto de Wobberton described him as the working man's ballet, Absolutely. which was the name of Hudson's autobiography that came yes, out. Is, um, yes. Well, I forget now, late 90s. No, it's been out a good 20 years now, hasn't it? So, a fantastic it's, it's book itself. It's come out um, mm. in. It came out recently because it had come out, I think you're right, I think it was 96. It, because it yeah, didn't mention but... about the car crash. Because on um, on the oh, 15th yeah. of December 1997, Alan had a hit and run um, that that almost killed him. Mm. Um, mm. He was given the last rights. They didn't think he was going to pull through. He he spent so much time in hospital, and we've we've covered that on many I podcasts. Yeah. Was this two months in a coma? Do I remember listening to one of the podcasts? Alan was um, 59 days in a coma. 59, yeah. He got it on the 15th of um, fifteenth of December 1997, and he woke up in uh, February 1998. Yeah. But he was going to be working on the uh, the World Cup finals in 1998 as well, and his life right. was, was transformed. But um, mm. a top player, a great man, yeah. and we're going yeah. to be talking about 1974. But yeah, they, they had a re-release a few years ago of the Working Man's Ballet, and that yeah. that that talks about the uh, the car the yeah. incident where Alan was involved in a hit and run. The the yeah. police deemed that that Hudson had walked in the road and a car struck him, but no, that's not the case. But um, <laughs> we will uh, we will leave that and move on. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading that. that yeah, one. I've not read it as of yet. I know yeah. it came out last year. But it was what a team that was. Oh, what yeah. a team! Gordon Banks as well, Shilton, wasn't it? Well, Gordon, uh, Gordon, had re- Gordon had retired by then because he retired by then. So, yeah, yeah, he's okay. um, he's, he's car crash. Um, oh, John yeah. Farmer yeah. was a goalkeeper and then replaced by Peter Shilton. Alan, yeah. Alan will always yeah. say that Farmer was a better goalkeeper than Shilton. Really, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think many Stoke fans would <laughs> echo that as well. But um, but Shilton um, joined the team. They'd already, of course, got Jimmy Greenough and Terry Conroy, and most of the players were already there. Waddington had assembled a fantastic group yeah. of players, and and Hudson, to all intent and purpose, was the last piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. And, uh, what a piece of the jigsaw. He was going to buy Peter Osgood as well. And he, he did wait <laughs> up all night for Ozzy to phone him. 
And when Alan seen him the next morning, thought, this is the kind of guy I want to work for. He's been up all night. But it, <laughs> but it was because he was waiting for Osgood, but Osgood didn't phone him. And, and of course, joined Laurie at Southampton. And where Os, uh, Osgood uh, went down into the second division with Southampton, Alan Hudson yep. really did transform Stoke City yeah. and turned them into yeah. a championship winning side. Yeah, great team. Great team. Great as, were, as, well. as were men. I mean, we had there's um, a barrel full of what is it? The Sheffield United book. Oh yeah, the um, yeah, the Sheffield United book that came out. Uh, the barrel of oh, um, oh, it'll come to me in a moment. Yeah, um, it came to me as well. Again, it came out for pitch, didn't it? Yes, it did. <clears throat> but again, Sheffield United in that season with Tony Curry. What a fabulous yeah. team. Ipswich Town, fabulous team. Yeah. You know, we had other sides that, that necessarily you wouldn't have thought would be up and running and vying for championships. We mentioned Green Forest. Park Rangers. <clears throat> you had Forest yeah. that come up from <laughs> second division and took the title in 78. So the 70s titles yeah. was won probably by more football clubs than, than yeah. any other decade. Of course, Derby County won it twice yeah. in the 70s. Everton won the first, Arsenal won the double. You know, there was lots of... Leicester City had a great side back in those days. Aston Villa in 76, 77, very unlucky, won the League Cup. But mm. had luck been shining on them and Andy Gray would have stayed fully fit. Uh, Aston Villa could have won the treble. You know, there was yeah. a lot of great, great sides. The 70s yeah, was absolutely. a was a fabulous decade of football. Before I move on to one link to that, uh, it was Ain't Got a Barrel of Money. That's it, it. Ain't Got a Barrel Full of Money. Yeah, we got song, yeah. and Curry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Woodwood it. It, wood, wood and Curry, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah, of course, it. Trevor Rocky, the smelliest feet in football <laughs> and the funkiest <laughs> car. And if you're wondering <laughs> what we're talking about there, all the patreons dot com forward slash SRB media, and you can listen to Tony Curry talk about those mm. Alcyon days at Bramall Lane. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, written by Jason Hollyhead. Yeah, yes, so, that's the one. Lifelong Sheffield United fan. So, uh, but linked to that, yeah, there's a book now. It's recently received, um, and it's called "They Played for David Plea at Luton Town." It's a book by Phil Duffy, uh, and it's an interview of a number of players. So. And on the back of it, January 1978, the Luton Town Football Club they were at a critical point of transition in their history, fresh out of Harry Hanslam's stewardship uh, as he moved to Sheffield United. He should also did in the appointment of the club's young coach. At that age, just 34 he was, 34 David mm-hmm. Pleat as the first team manager. Yeah, I didn't realise he was that young. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And the eight years that followed, David Pleat's, David Pleat's appointment are viewed yeah, probably the golden period in that club's history, so oh, the late right. 70s. Um, and, um, yeah, they picked up a num- number of admirers. And you think of the players that are mentioned, and the, the household names in this book, you've got Ricky Hill, Paul Walsh, Brian Steen, Mick Harford. Um, you know, some really good names there, and players, etc. So this book is a hell of a chunk of a book as well. And this is It's actually volume one. Oh. Well, this is so, uh, and it's uh, I think it's independently published as well. This book, um, but yeah, it's um, it's um, it's not just about David Plea, but it's yeah, it's a book about the players and the, the stories around them. But it's also players who didn't make you know the uh, the first team, etc. It's quite a, a wide variety, but definitely must read for Luton Town fans. And uh, yeah, it's uh, looks a really interesting read. But uh, again, another team, you know, yeah. about, around about that time that you don't. Really remember, but you remember some of the names, don't you? Ricky Hill and what have you, Paul yeah, Walsh. You, you certainly do, and and I think that Ooh. when you're looking at you know certain managers that are synonymous with the development, yeah. the growth of of teams like Luton, Graham Taylor springs yeah. to mind. Uh, yeah, you know yeah. at Watford and what a job he done at Watford. Again, yeah. not my cup of tea the way that he played football, but. You've got to give credit where it's due, and you, you know, you you would say Graham Taylor, and people would say, "Oh, what a job he done at Watford then," and you know, with David Pleat, you know, iconic times there, Bobby Robinson yeah. there at, at, at Ipswich Town, 
Tony Waddington, yeah. what he done, 17 uh, seasons there at Stoke City. You know, these are sides that are unfashionable sides, but managers were given licence to produce, and boy, did they produce. Now, if you don't produce in seven games in the Premier League, you get the sack. Well, and all of those ones you talked about are all uh, homegrown. It's very, I know it's Absolutely. a very different world then, of course. Mm. You know, you've not got the influence of the... Um, uh, the overseas it was, a, and, it was a better world, a better world back then. Managers yeah. had time to yeah. produce. Managers yeah. didn't have the daggers out from the first defeat that they'd encountered. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. people that owned football clubs were a lot more football savvy back in yeah. those days. They were, and that was a local butcher, wasn't it, or something like that? It was a local business owner that owned Well, the club again, as well. in terms of Burnley <laughs> Football Club, it was a local yeah, butcher. It know, was Bob That's Lord. It, Bob Lord. I mean, That's they it. they yeah. weren't saints, and and you know, I did say they'd know more about football, but I'm not convinced actually that I'm right when I do say <laughs> that. But you know, they must have employed people that knew things about football because yeah. you know, managers did stay. Why do you players stay? Players had testimonials. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now, if you play... I mean, if you actually see out your contract now as a player or a manager, you've done bloody well and you're loyal to that yeah. football club. It's crazy. You know, it footballers is. spent their whole lives at, at certain clubs and, you know, that's when, you know, football fans back in our day would say, he's a legend of that football club. You've only yeah. got to score a goal in an important game now, <laughs> and you're a legend. And that could be on a PlayStation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's I know. Crazy. <laughs> the longest serving manager now must be in the Premier League. It must be Jorgen Klopp with the four. I just in... think it's absolutely oh, bonkers. Football yeah. actually gets what it deserves these days because of the stupidity, <laughs> the naivety, and just the ridiculous um, yeah. way that football clubs are being run. You know, it, the, the thrust, the thrust always it's got to be about uh, winning now and everything. There's a, there's a real, yeah, everyone wants their team to win, etc. But it's that there's such a drive for so many teams to, and no one accepts second, do they, or third, and I don't know. But anyway, I could go off on a tangent there. I just you know, think as long as, in... as long as your team are playing good football and producing, yeah. then I'm happy. I mean, would yeah. I be happy going down and watching my team get beat three four? And having a great game and and being sixteenth in the league, whatever. Look, yeah, I would be, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I just want to. I want to watch. I just want to watch football. Yeah, that's what I want to watch. True. I don't want to watch a team grind out a result and I go home. Well, yeah, we've won or we've drawn one-one. What a boring game. The winning goal come off the backside of the of the uh, of the opponent's defenders. Uh, yeah. No, nah, didn't, didn't give me exciting, glorious football like we had in the 70s all day long. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned another book then from February. So again, um, yep. it was, um, came to me. Uh, and it's called, and again, this really goes back, it's called So Much More Than That. Uh, and the subtitle is The British Family Journey of Football History, War and Migration by Hannah Granger Clemson. Um, and it's it's really interesting because it focuses on a number of the the major cities. So you've got Glasgow, Birmingham are covered in this, Manchester and others. Uh, and it basically just talks about the fascinating family journey of football. And uh, uh, there's quite a bit on Birmingham, which is really quite interesting. So oh. You'll find it interesting to read as well. It talks about the industrial heartlands, you know, around yeah. Birmingham and how football was very much, um, you know, linked to that and how it grew in terms of its uh, importance, really, to the ordinary people that serve the time, etc. But it goes... Um, yeah, it explores that and delves into the, the light and the dark side of sport and society, uh, the passion, the, uh, the hard work, and uh, it talks about the, the lives of the Peaky Blinder gangs, etc. as well. Um, but it's really interesting. It's really well written as well. I've, again, I'm not really fully as of yet, but it's again, if you, I'm, I'm one of these, I love the history, and, you know, if you can link that to football as well, and it's, uh, it's a great concoction, really. Uh, and um, yeah, it's written by a lady that certainly knows her stuff. She's a professor who obviously loves football as well. Um, but, yeah, just talks about how football's culture is a complex and 
often controversial and the debates over uh, the rules, transfers, wages, rich owners, etc. Even then, uh, but nothing like what it is now. Of course, completely different in terms of the scale. But um, but they're no, really interesting. But again, it goes back to some of those earlier times as well. So um, but yeah, that's just recently come out, and yeah, you guessed they come out through pitch as well, <laughs> particular one as well. Yeah, um, right, but. Yeah, but it's uh, really interesting. So a really interesting mixture of those early days uh, as well. Um, and another one I'll mention is England's Calamity. Um, and this is based on that 1953 game, England against Hungary. Okay. So there was only a book that came out fairly recently, as you you yes, know of. Match of the Century yeah. by uh, yeah, Matt, Matt Clough. That's it, which mm. I know you did a fantastic podcast with as well, didn't you? No, I haven't uh, done one with Matt. Oh, have you not done it yet? Oh, no, I've I've been... not. They, they didn't get back to me. I did oh. a podcast, Alchemy. Ah, yes, about... that's what I think. Yeah, yep, okay. I did. Uh, I'm get mixed up. With, uh, with, that, with that book. We don't want yeah. of Alchemy, but we haven't. I'm going to be doing a podcast with... Um, Ajax of the 70s. Oh, All right, okay. Gary Thacker's new book. Oh, yes. I've done, I did, if you remember, a podcast with Gary talking about his beautiful bridesmaids dressed in orange. But his yeah. latest book comes out shortly. I think it might be May time that it comes out. You can yeah. pre-order it now, guys, if you go on to a search engine, look for Gary Thacker, and look at the Ajax book of the, uh, of the early 70s, where Ajax dominated. So, it's a nice little book that sits alongside the beautiful bridesmaids dressed in orange. Yeah. But Ajax, the difference is Ajax wasn't bridesmaids. They <laughs> were the bride. I think it's called Dutch Masters, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, when they conquered Europe. Yes, I think it is, yeah. yeah total yeah. football. So, uh, no, great writer again, is he, uh, Gary Packer? I remember you, just, you did a podcast with him yeah. on his book on Chelsea as well, if yes, I remember. Yes, 2012, yeah. Yeah, yeah out, the out of the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great writer and part of the um, the uh, oh god, what they called now? Uh, these the, football times. These football times. Yeah, that's the thing yeah. when you don't have things written down <laughs> and it's off the top of your head. <laughs> but uh, a great uh, writing group, uh, yeah, and and um, and podcasters to boot. Fantastic books that have come out of that project and um the the fella Horsefield who's written yes, a book about yeah. nineteen nine nineteen eighty two Brazil. Stuart yeah. Horsefield. So that again yeah. that's a, they tend to write these books, do something and then think, Oh, there's another book there and they're very important group of books. And Aidan Williamson has wrote The Neely Men yeah. as well. So there's some great writing from uh, from those fellas. Yeah. And also, let's mention while we're talking about different podcasters, uh, the Blizzard by um, Jonathan Wilson, who's written so yeah. many fantastic books as well. Well yeah. done, Jonathan. Yeah, one of my favourite authors, definitely Jonathan Wilson. One of my favourite authors that I've never read, <laughs> but I have got his books. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all but his you... books from these fellas, but I just haven't <laughs> read them. Well, point. if you ever do, if you ever decide to, decide to read one of them, and you might think the title, I'm not sure about that, but there's a book called Inverting the Pyramid, and it's uh, it's the history of football tactics. Now that might sound, it's definitely one of those. If you looked at it, you thought, I'm mm, not sure about that. But when you read it, it's a uh, it's a fascinating book, and it's one of the most um, uh, it's in top ten lists of many many people's favourite books. It's a classic, and it's just the way it's written. Uh, it's about history of football, but it's linked to tactics and how it's all changed as well. But it's I uh, don't like tactics. I would never well, read but, that book. And that's, I've and that's what's fascinating. To, I've listened yeah. to Jonathan talk <laughs> tactics about England and that. Yeah. And and I turn him off when <laughs> when he talks about that. Just talk about the historic content and what you know. I, yeah. I, I'm not a great lover of non-footballing people talking about football in a tactical way because yeah. I don't I think it. I don't think we know what we're on about you know yeah. we've all played football but unless you've actually played Ray how can you say this on TalkSport 
unless you play the game, you don't know what you're going on about. And yeah. it, and it and it does wind a lot of football fans up. But it's very true. Yeah. It's very true oh, because yeah. unless you've been in that dressing room, and I've listened to tales of the dressing room from yeah. Terry and from Alan and from other players that I've um, made podcasts with, but mm. we we don't know what it's like. And and, yeah. and again, I've always been of the opinion that. You get your tactics, stick them up your back. So I don't like <laughs> tactics. Oh I, I yeah, um, it's football <laughs> players that win games, not tactics. I'm not. Yeah. I'll never buy tactics. I don't like it. You, you'll probably prefer his other book, man. The name's heard long ago. That's the one on the hunger. Oh, that, oh, that's, uh, that, that's the best one. That's yeah. a proper book. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is a proper book. That's beautifully written. Yeah, and has he not recently book. wrote one about Jack and um, and Bobby as well? Did, yeah, did Jonathan yeah. do, do yeah, one? two brothers. That's the one. Yeah, two brothers. Uh, obviously, there's been a few books out. I don't know. As you, I remember you reminded me on one of the podcasts before, but uh, yeah, yes, he did that last year. The story of Jack and Bobby Charlton. Um, yeah, he wrote last year as well. And uh, as every book, yeah, as we talk, popular. Yeah, as we're talking about two brothers, uh, galvanized mm. by David Safer. David oh, wrote yes. a lot of Leeds United books. In fact, you yeah. wrote the um, the autobiography with uh, with Alan Clark, amongst others. Uh, tale of uh, two football brothers, Chris and Tony Galvin, with uh, contrasting fo- fortunes. But uh, yeah. that looks like it's going to be a good book by David. And Colin Abbott, his latest book uh, is out either now or shortly. Uh, yeah. Charlie Aitken's autobiography. And I know Colin, um, Colin is a, a, a pal of mine and he's been working on this book for a long time. And right. Colin has written so many Villa books, it's untrue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happens again, talking about the Football Times guys, you put things on the back burner, then you go back and he's gone back and he's finished it now with Charlie. And we did mention legends of football clubs and, Charlie Aitken does sit nicely in that mm. category of being a legend of Aston Villa Football Club. And yeah. New York Cosmos, yeah. of course. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But other books that's coming out as well, should I mention some books yep. that's coming out very you soon, just along our, along our lines? Um, you've got, uh, I'll skim over this quote, because it's 1992, and it's the birth, as it calls it, the birth of modern football, which I guess is true, really, the yep, birth let's of modern skip. football. <laughs> Let's yeah, that one. <laughs> and I, I, it's the, one thing I will mention is when I shared that, because I always share about boxers coming out, whether it grabs my attention or not, but I shared yes, it on do. Twitter. I've never seen so many uh, comments. It creates a lot of debate when I shared that on Twitter, uh, similar to your response as well. So, I mean, a bit of a modern book. You know, I guess Rob Fletcher's wrote that book. He's literally just, you know, he's, he's just... You can't blame him. It's not not him that changed football. He didn't introduce, you know, Sky. <laughs> he just literally decided to write a book about that first year kind of thing. So, uh, you know, and everyone could talk about how it's changed after that and uh, not for the best, of course. Um, do you know again, what I do, though? Everyone's opinions, but when? at least he wrote a book about it and some people have never written the book, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that it, was his subject. He decided, but... Yeah. It's a, book, debate. <laughs> it's a book I would never read because yeah. I'm not interested in that. But I would mm. never comment in a derogatory manner because good Correct. luck, good Spot luck on. to everyone. So yeah. you share lots and lots and lots of books through yeah. your Facebook and Twitter sites, and yeah. I will then retweet and share the books that you share that I like because yes. what you do is. Should be. Yeah, you're given books. So you're given books and you put them out. This is what yeah. our football podcast is about. We yeah. talk about football okay. books that are coming out. Some books that I like, some books that I don't. But I don't dwell yeah. on the ones that I don't because I skip and I move on. But yeah, I would absolutely. never, never comment in a derogatory manner. I just look at the books I like, focus on what I like and share yeah. what I like. And forget, yeah, exactly. That. And just skip exactly the ones that. that that don't really take me fancy. But you know, some of the books that don't take you fancy could be some of the best books that you've never read. I, 
It's spot on. There's many of uh, as you know, I'm an Nottingham Forest fan, but yeah. some of the best books I've written is about other clubs. Absolutely. Uh, I could think of some great books I've read about Rochdale, and yeah. believe me, I've got no link to Rochdale whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but there's some brilliant books written by Rochdale by a guy called Mark, uh, Mark Hodgkinson. Um, that was that season got, in the winter, wasn't it? Yeah, the longest winter. Yeah, yeah. But that's just another example, I guess. Just, there's books about clubs that I don't necessarily follow, mm. but they're brilliant stories. Yeah. Uh, and some of the best books, exactly as you've said, are not necessarily books I would have necessarily thought, hmm, but there you go. But again, I think that's what... I've always been a champion of reading anyway, as you well know, for these podcasts. Um, yep. But I think uh, it helps you build your knowledge of football. Of course it does. Uh, and you appreciate, because we all live in that little bit of a bubble. Certainly you see on Twitter, a meltdown when your club's lost one game, even though they probably won the 10 games previous. Two's left one. You know, the club's rubbish. We need you know get rid of the manager. And it's a meltdown. And every fan's exactly the same. I and mean, then once you realise you read books about other clubs, you kind of... Oh yeah, they're like us as well at West Ham, at um, Birmingham, at Leeds. They're all we're all the same. We've all got our own passions, kind of thing. But we've all got different stories, and that's what's fascinating about it, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, like from the past to the present, isn't it? So, and the one thing I mentioned on that as well, I'm moving on quickly on, is uh, there is uh, the story of the Potteries Derby, uh, El Serium. I can't yeah. get this pronounced right. Yeah. Serimaco uh, yeah. by Liam Bullet. So. It's the um, uh, story of yeah Stoke City Port Vale, um, so um, yeah it it talks about obviously it's a robbery for obviously for people in that area. It's again linked to wherever area, you know it's important to you, isn't it? But uh, all good robberies require history, territorial conflicts, exciting incidents, past two fans, etc. And this one yeah explores that history of that, um, and yeah with first hand. First on the count, telling the story of a robbery like no other. So uh, I think Liam Bullock is the author. I think he's from the Stoke City side. I'm sure he is because I've you know, read a couple of his books. Um, but that's one, yeah, that's coming out <coughs> coming out in March. And of course, Stan, um, Stan, Ma- Stan Matthews is the manager of Port Vale. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a link and. Brian Little was going to sign for Stan. Stan wanted Brian to sign yeah. at Port Vale. Yeah. Then he got the sack and Brian went to Aston Villa, fell in love with Villa and signed at Villa Park. But uh, yeah. yeah, Stan was a, a former player of Stoke City that managed to Port Vale. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, uh, another book that's coming out is called Field of Dreams by Nigel Tassel. Nigel Tassel's another great author. He's written a number of excellent books. Uh, one of my favourite ones is called The Bottom Corner, which is based on non-league football. But The Field of Dreams, it's about 100 years of Wembley in 100 matches. Ooh, that's um, really good. Yeah, it's really good and really great author. Straight away, you know, it's going to be a good book. But it's uh, it includes everything. It, 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 one of the first ones he talks about in the synopsis is the 1923 FA Cup final, ACA, you know, the White Horse final, yep. which you remember the first football match played at the British Empire Exhibition Stadium. Um, as it was known then, um, but it goes through yeah a number of games, 100 matches. So I'm sure games are. I'd be amazed the 1966, for example, is not included in there. Yeah. Um, but I know it also includes the yeah, FA Cup final when Bert Troutman broke his neck. Yep. Famously in um, playing for Man- Manchester City, City, City against Birmingham, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. Part so, of the youth, wasn't I? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, which is again a fascinating again, book on its own mm-hmm. as well. A fascinating doc- documentary as well, if you ever get a chance yes. to see it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's Field of Dreams. So, uh, about, um, yeah, 100 years of Wembley and 100 matches. So, it'll be interesting to see what 100, 100 matches he's chosen. But um, interesting. I'd, yeah, either way, I'm sure it'll be an interesting read. Uh, there's, there's authors out there that can... I don't know, they could write a shopping list and make it sound exciting, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you're a good author, you can put you, you can make anything sound good. Yeah. I just wish I could. Um, um, and then another one that's coming out in March, um, it's called Divided Cities, which kind of linked a little bit to the derbies I've been talking about, yeah. but this one's about the most, uh, the world's most passionate single city derbies. So, uh, yeah, rather is everywhere in football, isn't it? So, but it's, um, uh, about derbies from across all the cities in the yeah on earth, basically. So the rich history of our clubs, etc. And that's again coming out through pitch uh, in March. 
that particular one. So, um, yeah. And then, yeah, into April, if you want me to carry on, there's another, another one that's coming out, which again linked to derbies, which I seem to talk about. It's called the Cross in the Park, and it's the men who dare to play for both Liverpool and Everton. Yes, I've seen uh, that. So yeah. yeah, that's it. So some of the players mm. that have done that. Um, yeah, they've uh, crossed the bridge. Peter Beardsley is one of them springs to mind. Manager-wise, you've got Rafa Benitez. Which Gary Ablett well, as it? well. Gary, Gary Ablett, Ablett played yeah. for both. Uh, yeah. Steve McMahon played for both. Yeah, Nick Barnby, I remember. Yeah, he I think one Nick of them Barnby as well. played for both, didn't he? He played for yeah. Spurs as well. Yeah, there's, yeah. Um, there's, there's, when you sit down and you you think about it, there's probably quite a lot that... I believe Kevin Sheedy actually was a Liverpool player that went to Everton, wasn't he? I think Sheed started his career at Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah you think he might I don't, be right, yeah. I don't think he played many or any games, but I'm sure he played... At Liverpool, and then he moved over uh, Stanley Park to um, to Everton at Goodison. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, Carragher Carragher was um, Carragher was a was a red one, eh? Sorry, a blue he, that played blue, for, yeah, uh, yeah. played for, for Liverpool. So you know, for yeah. his are split up there in Merseyside, <laughs> similar to Birmingham, yeah. but you know, it is yeah, it, right, it is what it is, isn't it? I think Stephen Gerrard has he captured a picture of him wearing an Everton kit? I think once. Well, did, did, you know, when didn't, he was a kid. Didn't, didn't Michael Owen's dad play for Everton? Is that, yeah, yeah, I think there was something like that. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Horror. There'd probably be people screaming down this now, going, "No, you're wrong." But yeah, I probably. Think you're right. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure that there's Stephen McManaman was a blue as well that um, yeah. that played for uh, for Liverpool. So yeah, it'll be a, be a very interesting uh, read, and we can actually read whether we were right or whether we were wrong. <laughs> Absolutely, then one of the certain three uh, games. And then one of them, on three games course, in May, I want to mention Rob Carr. Oh yes, uh, yeah. about Manchester United playing three. Yeah. G- I mean, they didn't just play three games in May in that <laughs> season, but I think that those were the iconic games, the European Cup final, the last yeah. game of the Football League season and the FA Cup final as well but uh, Rob has um, encapsulated all of that in the book and again I think very popular books these days are yeah. um, extracts and um, pieces from the supporters that were there and looking at it through their eyes and, yeah. uh, I'm not sure if there's any <clears throat> players or managers that, that that got involved, but um, it does look like a fascinating book. Three games yeah, I've got that in book. May. I've, yeah, I've got that book too with the forwards by Steve Bruce. So um, you've yeah. got yeah, you've got some players involved in that. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And so, um, that's out through um, Morgan Lawrence Publishing. Yes, so, uh, Matthew yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think there. that comes out. Comes out in May, did you say? Is it May? I I, I would have thought so. March. I would have yeah. thought so because it, I mean it is three days in May, so um, I think that yeah. the I think it's already out now, but I think it's probably going to be the publication date when it's released would be in May. But I have yeah. seen it on his socials with various people holding the book up, so the hard copy is out now. But um, for those that are dropping through your door, well your letterbox <laughs> that you've paid for. Uh, rather than contributed towards that will yeah. probably will drop in May. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. What else we got, mate? Oh well, another book that comes out in April is The Great Days of Sunderland. Uh okay. and it's the subtitle of six league titles and two FA Cups. Yeah, they did win a so, lot back then, didn't they? Yeah, that's it. So uh a team of talents that dominated English football in the nineteen eighteen nineties to the side that almost won the double in 1913. So uh, the great team in the 1930s that challenged the riches of Arsenal and the most recent success in the 50 years when second division in Sunderland beat the mighty Leeds in yes. the FA, FA, uh, FA Cup final, of course. Yeah, no, uh, So, yeah, that looks uh, it's a great read. Great. Uh, I love the cover of that one as well, I must admit. So uh, it's a nice uh, simple picture on the front of celebrating at Wembley. Um, and that's written by David Potter, so uh, uh, a nostalgic kind of trip down memory lane for Sunderland for a hotbed of football, isn't it? Up there, and you see, yeah, you see Newcastle, Newcastle at the weekend. 
I was in the League Cup final. Uh, and Sunderland, I think they're creeping up as well. I think they're up for potential promotion as well, aren't they? Coming back into the... Yes, they're having a nice uh, season. Yeah, they're not I doing too bad. I don't think they're going to quite cut it this year, mm. you know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, they've, they've, they've come up from League One. Uh, Maiden Roads into the Championship got themselves in a competitive position and you know who yeah. knows with games you know running thick and fast now and it's getting towards a serious end of the season that, yeah. that you never know I personally think Borough uh, will do it yeah. Um, yeah. Sheffield United and of course Burnley are runaway leaders but uh, yeah. those, those yeah. are my three but who knows if it goes to the playoffs it's an absolute lottery. So uh, good, oh, luck. It is. good luck to Sunderland, and let's hope that those great times return because the Premier League or the First Division or whatever you want yeah. to call it needs a Sunderland as it has got a Newcastle these days because yeah. Sunderland were falling from grace in the mm. 1890s. Newcastle were picking up the baton and running with it in the North East, wasn't they? They were, they were one of the first super clubs of the world, Newcastle. And there's a great book that uh, tells the story of those those halcyon days. They do, yeah. The Great Days. Uh, that was yep. a book that came out, I think it was last year, actually. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, it was a book that I shared recently, um, um, 1904 to 1911. It's yep. actually written by David Potter, the same author of that book I've just referred to. Okay. Poland. He wrote Newcastle United, so he obviously knows his stuff in that area. Yep. Uh, he's actually written many books. I've seen many of his books, actually. He's written, I think, of, not just football, actually, cricket as well. Um, right. about. But yeah, Newcastle United, they were... Um, well, a football mad city, but they, yeah, they were they won the English league title three times in five years. The English, uh, the FA Cup, uh, and there's seven near misses. And many of the players played for Scotland and England, etc. So yeah, it's another fascinating book of the, about the tune. Fantastic. Look that way. So, um, one of them I mentioned that came out uh, last year is called The Big Deal. Uh, fascinating book. I read it over Christmas, um, and it's. What's fascinating is that it's 100 managers and it talks about their greatest signing and the one that got away. Oh, that's Richard what's... Sydenham, isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know of him, yeah. And Rag. And John Rag, yeah. yeah. But what's amazing is the, the amount of people they managed to get for this book. Yeah. Uh, some of the names they've got are stellar names. I, I'm on, um, well, your modern day, you've got your Jurgen Klopp's in there, but you've got Kevin Keegan, uh, Graham Soonis, Brian Robson, Brendan Rogers. Uh, and you've got Ron Atkinson. I love Ron Atkinson, which I've got here, actually. I've still got it highlighted. Uh, and like I say, it's about their best signing and their worst Robert. ever signing. And the, yes, you've David got it. Mills. You've got it already. David Mills what, is sorry? worst. David Mills is worst. He's, well, the, well sorry, the, um, it's not the worst. It's the one oh. that got away. Oh, right, okay. Sorry, yeah. Uh, that would probably be good, actually. That would probably be a follow-up book, actually. The, one, the worst ever signing. It That'd would be, be David Mills at West Brom, I remember Ron saying. The, Did he say he that? Just, he, just, he just bought the most expensive bus driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, his big his big deal was Brian Robson, yeah, from West yeah, Brom Robbo. to Man United for one point five million, which yeah. was record at the time. But the one that got away was Gary Lineker. Right, um, okay. He didn't manage to get Gary Lineker uh, from Leicester City to Manchester United. Uh, Butcher as well. Butcher, Teddy, oh, Teddy yeah. Butcher, okay. that was one that got away. Yeah. Butch was going yeah. to Man United, he'd, he'd primed him. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah some, was... but there's some great, great, great names in it. This the great managers have picked out. John Barnwell, do you know that? Remember yeah, that name, Barney. Manager? Yeah, Wolves. Yeah. That's it. So uh, he's picked better than the one with Emin Hughes from yep. Liverpool to Wolves. Yeah. But the one that got away, which stands out, um, Michelle Platini <laughs> from Set Up to Young. So uh, he needed. I can't imagine Platini playing for Wolves. No. Somehow. No, no, I think you're right there. I'm hoping to get to the Black Country. But... I mean, the biggest, yeah. one, the biggest one that got away, although he was never there, was um, Zinedine Zidane at Newcastle yeah. United. Barry Barry Siltman had, had offered Kevin Keegan uh, Zinedine Zidane. And yeah. Kevin's team, someone from his team, went to watch ZZ. And Wolves were bottom of the championship at the time. And the response come back um, from Kevin. Kevin didn't watch Zinedine Zidane, by the way. It was 
one of his team and he said we've had him watched and in our opinion mm. he's not good enough to play for Wolverhampton <laughs> Wanderers was the <laughs> oh no it's crazy isn't and it? he said Kevin you are making the biggest mistake ever and yeah. then, uh, Roberto Betega took him to Juventus and I think within yeah. a couple of seasons they'd uh, sold him on to Real Madrid for 45 million but yeah. New, I think Newcastle could have had him for about five million at the time. Yeah, I bet you another one then, Brian Little. So his, his, I'll tell you his um, his best deal it was Gareth Southgate. He's yeah. here. It yeah. was his best deal from Crystal Palace. Uh, but the ones that got away, I don't know if you know that from um, uh, well, he's put uh, he's picked up two actually. So Philip Cocker from PSV Eindhoven okay. uh, and Les Ferdinand. So he missed that one out um, mm. from QPR at the time. So uh, I think he went on to Newcastle, if I remember right. He did do bad there, Sir Les. He was known up there. Yeah, good player. So, good yeah. Player. Yeah. So but really good book, though. Uh, yeah, called The Big Deal. So uh, 100 managers, and I can, you can go on and on. It's just really interesting looking yeah. at yeah, the best deals. Mark Hughes is the one that stands out. Because uh, you forget that um, Vincent Company at Manchester City, because he was, you know, um, uh, arguably with the new Man City, let's say, but you forget Mark Hughes was the one that brought Vincent Company to um, Manchester yeah. City mm. before he went off. But um, yeah, do a really good book that one. So Richard Seidman, um, as you know, he's written a number of books uh, on uh, Villa as well, amongst others. Absolutely, um, yeah, good writer. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, that, yeah, there's a number of other books that's coming out. So um, it's another fascinating month. That's coming up in uh, in April, uh, March and April. So uh, it never ceases to amaze me how many football yeah. books are written each yeah. month of each year. <laughs> you just can't keep up, and it is a good job that there are people like you that <laughs> promote them because through you I've learned of so many different books, and some I've I've okay. bought and not read. I can't say that there's some that I've bought and read because I haven't. But, no. But, you know, I, I do add them to my library and uh, and I think it's great. And there are football magazines that, that promote them. Um, yeah. When Saturday comes, I've got a, a book corner in in their pages, as has Back Pass as well and World Soccer Magazine. And the publishers that keep, publishing these great books and the writers, the authors, the podcasters, yeah. etc. that just keep it alive and, and keep ticking over that knowledge of football because no matter how much we think that we know about football, we actually don't know that much. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the, they do it for the love of the book as well. Yeah. To say you're an, an, a published author, that's, uh, that's certainly something to tick off your bucket list, isn't it? Of your Some things I will never ever say. <laughs> Yes, maybe I will one day, but we'll, you uh, might maybe do. You, a... you might do. You could. You could. You could write a football book. I mean, we'll I could. The... I'd, I'd struggle to string a sentence together. <laughs> well, maybe you just need a good writer, Paul, and then uh, yeah, I need know. a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> you need a ghost writer. Yes. Yeah, I do. So, definitely. Yeah. Just write down what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah. But they don't do it for the love and the money. There's not books that you don't make a lot of money unless it's a really you know, a classic seller, uh, and even then, you're not going to make, um, you're not going to live off a book, let's say, like a J.K. No. Rowling uh, in football terms. But um, what you create, as long as you cover your costs, etc., you know, they just do it with the love of uh, putting pen to paper. And uh, thank you for the many doing that. And I don't know if it's just a coincidence since I've been doing this, but it does definitely feel like there's more books out than ever. No, without um, a doubt. Which I'm certainly not complaining about. Yeah, no, we, um, without a doubt. How many books on average yeah. now are you being sent? Every month. Oh, that's a good one. So has that, this gr- week, has that grown? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. it has. As I, I've come more pop. Uh, the website, uh, me, the website's come more popular. Yeah. Um, because um, I certainly, as you well know, I don't do it for any kind of money. No, no, and yeah. it's in my eyes. It's very much a hobby. And I do it very much to promote authors. But mm. I, I, I've got, I'm just looking here. I've got these six books I had this week. Mm. So yeah, for so six months this week. So uh, um, it seems to pick up around about 
around about this time, March, April time, yeah. and then you have September, October, which is coming up to the Christmas kind of period. Mm-hmm. They're definitely busy, but um, yeah, ever since it's just grown and grown, I get more and more requests. I get I get requests literally every day now, um, maybe a couple a day, from uh, whether it's through Twitter, Facebook, or just through the website, contact me. Would you be interested in, you know, having a read of my book and uh, or promoting it? It's, and I just haven't got round to... I can't really literally read all of them. There's just, you know, no, if anyone impossible. out there is thinking I read all of these, no, the ones I've just rolled off, I can't. I can't. But these books that I, there's definitely ones like you, that, you know, you like the 1982, you know, book. I will read that. Yeah. That is, that's of interest to me. There is other books where, and it's not necessarily it's a bad book, but I, I can skim through. I can skim read it quite quickly and get a gist of it, you know, mm-hmm. and move on. So, uh, but any book that, and I'll say that to any authors that's listening out there, if you've got a book coming out, um, or you've had a book recently come out, uh, just please get in touch. And I'm happy to at least promote it through the websites, through Twitter, yeah, and um, obviously and promote it on our podcast as well that we do. Absolutely. And you can like the podcast that I make with the authors. Mm. You know, yeah. I, I, I would struggle to read the book and then make the podcast. Mm. Yeah. With Gary Edwards, The Summer of 63, Don Redd's yeah. Plan for Legion United. I read at least half of that book. I found it very, very interesting. I read. I'm reading half of books because by the time I've actually started reading it, and then I'm making another podcast, Is and that... then I'm researching with the podcast. The time has elapsed, and I'm ready to do the podcast, and and it's just impossible to keep reading all these books because when you've got a full time job as well, and it's just your hobby, yeah. you haven't yeah, got the time yeah. to do that. But exactly. you know, it is fantastic because. I don't know if you're like me. I I just love to have the book. I love to look oh, yeah. at the book, and even if I don't read it, I've got it in my library, and I I just look at the book and I think that's oh, fantastic. Yeah, you know? I know I know exactly what you mean. I've got this. Um, I'm in the process at some stage of having this uh, a built-in kind of uh, bookcase uh, purpose-built. I have all my books have on it, which cover from wall. Have a word in mind, Mrs. So, so she can do yeah. one for me. I've got no <laughs> chance, mate. Oh, well, I know, I know. That's the, um, yeah, because a lot of it's still in containers, uh, in storage. So I just physically haven't got them. But one day, when I have a house that big, I could put it all on one wall. And, but I think, like you said, there's something about a book that just looks looks great, doesn't it? You would it's, need uh, a castle yeah. for the amount of books that you've got. <laughs> <laughs> you need the West Wing, mate. <laughs> it's fr- uh, yeah, exactly. It's frightening. I think if I've read every book, I think uh, this conversation wise, if I've read every book that I've got, you know, every book that I've been sent over the last couple of years, I probably have to live to about three hundred or something like that to yeah. read all of them. I know. So, uh, well, it's just not possible. It's frightening. <laughs> and what I've tended to do more recently is just nail down and focus on the seventies really yeah. and because you you can you know you get these but you look at that book you think that's great I want to read that and it just, yeah. you just don't have time be great yeah. to you know wake up in the morning and think oh I've got to read a book or research <laughs> or do a podcast and and you could you could do that but when you've got life and work yeah. that you <laughs> have to like you know get involved in it makes it very very difficult so so yeah, again, yeah. thanks to all that that do produce these books, we do give it a mention on the podcast. We will yeah. reference, we will make podcasts, we will promote, but we unfortunately haven't got time to read all these books. But we we will do our best yeah. for you, and we will reconvene in probably four weeks' time. We've got yeah. January and February out of the way now, and. This podcast yeah. will come out in March, so um, before the end of the football season, round about the end of probably middle to uh, end of April after yeah. Easter, we'll do another podcast promoting more books from uh, myfootballbooks.com, Andy. Thank you. Excellent. Thank Enjoy you. it. Thank Enjoy you for your time, sir, and thank you all for listening. Um, until next time. I'll leave you with the two words that you always love to leave us with. Yeah, happy reading, everyone. Correct. <laughs> Three words, <laughs> <but> happy reading. <laughs> happy reading. <laughs>
Bye all. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, my cat. Sarabi. All the best. Bye bye. Sarabi. Bye bye.